I think you know the 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 key is that we really want to leave with a with a positive message that you know there is probably a role uh, for immune therapy in patients with HCC. It's just a role that needs to continue to be defined. Um, and as we understand more and more uh, the biology and the immunology of this disease, I think we see that there are ways to enhance uh, the activity of these PD-1 inhibitors, but also you know understand a little bit more what biomarkers may be driving response. So there's a the the, the tumor specific. Uh, 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 enhancing tumor-associated antigen exposure. We've heard about uh, radiation and other local regional therapies, perhaps. Uh, also, double uh, double blockade, uh, double ICI blockade, adding uh, uh, CTLA-4 inhibitor. But also think about the OXO-40, LIF-3, and IO IO combinations. One of the, as we said, one of the very interesting. Um, Areas of development is essentially anti-VEGF combinations. We're we'll going to hopefully hear soon about bevacizumab and atezolizumab, but there are a number of others, well, and and, uh, uh, and and others as well, uh, and also migrate to the tumor. I want to present a quick case of a patient. Actually, this is a real patient case, 58-year-old uh, uh, female with history of hepatitis C. We essentially got eventually diagnosed with a large tumor in the right lobe of the liver. Um, biopsy essentially suggests HCC. Uh, she had Charles uh, Pew, uh, Pew A, BCLC stage B. Her AFP at diagnosis was 251.3. Actually, she went on a study with uh, tremilumab and, and durvalumab as, as first line. Uh, so this is on, on, a, on, uh, on a clinical trial with excellent tolerability. Actually, she did pretty well. And her response continues. This was in March 2019, quite significant response uh, since July 2018, uh, and continues to, uh, to march on. And then uh, her alpha fetoprotein seen a nice drop and essentially remains pretty flat. So quite a significant response and a very rewarding one. Uh, and the patient continues to do fantastic on the dual. OK, I think. Uh, that's uh, that's just to represent, you know, a, a little nice summary about hope for moving forward with these immunotherapy agents. So, Dr. Abu Alpha, perhaps you can talk a little bit more because you're one of the leader of of this uh, of this study, correct? The Himalaya. Well, nicely done, Tony. And if anything, I agree with you that uh, very important that. Uh, uh, it just happened that we are a little bit in a still dynamic phase at the moment, so we should not really come to or jump to final conclusions, I don't use this or I don't use that. Um, interestingly, just to give a little perspective for the discussion that uh, many of us were involved in, if two years ago or even three years ago, I would say that what if the Nevo versus Sorafni will be negative, it was like, it's like a blasphemy. Like <laughs> people look at you like as if you said something that you should never say. And if anything, it really gives the perspective. I think the bottom line is at the moment the question is, it's not anymore if they work or they don't. They definitely do. And I think Axel already said that as well. It's a matter of like how to kind of place them and where do they state in regard to the therapy. And in addition to that, will they, however, be able to overcome the survival benefit by maybe a combination as you just referred to, for example, the Himalaya or even a TKI plus a uh, Jake point inhibitor. So I think there's a lot of work to do, and I would say that I would envision a few years down the road, we're going to look back at the day like today and say, what were we thinking at that time? Because clearly, this is still in action. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a couple of, I mean, I think we got so used to the Rafnip being around that we didn't appreciate that it's really an active drug. It is an active drug in first line HCC. It beats Sinitinib. And we, I don't, still don't understand exactly why the Rafnip works and Sinitinib doesn't work. Um, second point, do you, uh, Gassan, do you have any idea about whether the CTLA-4 plus PD-1 combination induces higher response rates in the data that we've seen so far? Because we're really looking at is the durability of the response, but in order to have durability of response, you have to have a response in the first place. Yeah, I, I probably will defer on that second question because, as you know, I chair the Himalaya and the probably I'll defer on that for now. Uh, uh, but uh, in regard to your first point, I totally agree. Uh, like, how come uh, Sorafnib did make it and others did not, even though there were like very potent and geogenic, among which right. BEV, including, you know, the first studies. 
interestingly, it appears to be that uh, you want an anti-angiogenic component, but you don't want to be a very tough anti-angiogenic component. It's really like, you know, the kind of uh, right dosing of the different targets that really probably made sorafenib and the multi-targeted made sorafenib kind of, you know, pass that uh, frame. Interestingly, however, a very important perspective, and I think Tony brought it up before, sorafenib had a luxury that none, nowadays doesn't exist. It was sorafenib versus placebo. Actually, the study, that's why we didn't lead it here, because how would we even, the perception of even putting patient on placebo was like, like really far-fetched, and that's why it accrued mostly in Europe. Um, interesting nowadays, uh, with the complexity of all what we have on board, uh, like what are we comparing to what? And that's really where, uh, again, back to Howard's question, is like what's the no novelty of how to do clinical trials nowadays? The fact that you know patients will be exposed to multiple drugs and different approaches before even they get to the clinical trial per se. So the perception, especially in HCC of placebo, is like almost inexistent now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but still, I mean, Zorafenib was compared to sunitinib. You know, and sunitinib really Correct. behaved almost like placebo, you know. That's where the first then there answer is. Yeah. And I think we, we really yeah. didn't really, and there was a difference between hep C versus hep B related patients. So it's, there's still so much to learn from even the older trials, you know. Absolutely, I totally agree. And I like the, first, the, the last point you bring up. This is something that we are heavily interested in. At the moment, uh, believe it or not, we're working with 46 countries collecting tissue for HCC and analyzing based on ethnicity and etiology any differences in regard, as you mentioned, for example, Hep B, Hep C. And interestingly enough, we published that a little bit earlier, uh, 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 later last year uh, in CCR. It appears to be that what we thought it might be difference in regard to Hep C, HCC is different from Hep HCC. We're not necessarily 100% sure about that. So this is something yet to de de delineate further. Okay. Noam, last question, last comment. Sorry, yesterday I was asked about cost. So I'm going to turn the tables. What, what's the cost difference between the TKIs and the IOs? And does that affect your treatment decision at all for It's all patients? very cheap, you know. <laughs> 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 yeah, good question. Uh, it's know. an excellent question. I think it has to put, be put in perspective uh, with a lot of things. You know, cost of drug alone is, is, is certainly a consideration, but it's not the only consideration. I think it's very misguiding oftentimes. Uh, when these op-eds in New York Times and others just focus on the drug cost, whereby actually it's more than drug cost. In fact, you know, we did previously an analysis looking at fulfarin ox versus, which is all genetic drugs versus gem, nap, paclitaxel every other week, uh, which is the modification we use the most. And actually gem, nap, paclitaxel, which has a very expensive drug in the midst, ended up being cheaper overall than fulfarin ox. So, you know, this is a complex the com a complex uh, discussion, but there's certainly the IOs are, are quite expensive, uh, but then for some patients they do a great job. So again, how do you put it in perspective with response, toxicity, hospitalizations, intravenous administration, uh, you know, and, and all, the, uh, all the other things that need to be, so it's yeah. a very complex issue. So one, one point, I, I think we're, we're also collecting ideas for next year's great debates, and I do believe at some point we need to have a cost talk, you know, about, and, and costs from different perspectives, society, patients, insurers, you know, and the cost of that. Because, you know, cost is really in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. The way things are being calculated in the UK is more for, for cost for a society. That's why, for instance, kipsidrin is preferred as the fluoroprimidin that they like to see, whereas here we look for more cost per patient, you know, where oral agents might have a problem. So the I think we need to have a cost discussion, cost debate, cost, uh, probably an overview uh, talk. So we'll, we'll take that into account.